pray, God very often gives us something to do. He gives us courage to confront situations. If you feel that you're being controlled by fear, you need to pray and ask God to help you. But what he's going to give you is the courage to confront it. He's not going to necessarily just make every feeling of fear go away. Matter of fact, I can tell you that at different times in your life, you're going to feel fear. I'm a pretty bold person, but there's times when I feel fear. Usually when we get in a situation that's new for us, we'll feel fear. When we get in a situation where we feel we're kind of over our head and don't really know what to do, we'll feel fear. There's all kinds of fears. Actually, if you look up phobias, the different types of phobias, there are literally pages of things that people become afraid of. We get afraid of people and we let them rule our lives. We need to confront people that are manipulative and controlling. You're going to stand before God and answer for your life. And you need to make sure that you're listening to God about your life and doing what God wants you to do, not being manipulated and controlled by somebody else who's not going to give an account for your life. Amen. We need to confront boldly, we need to boldly confront situations in our life. We should never be afraid of circumstances. We should never be afraid of trouble, of trials and tribulations, because the greater one lives in us. First of all, I'd like us to look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. Thank you, Father, for the word today. Let it be rich and powerful and impacting and make a huge difference. Huge difference in our lives. 2 Peter 3, 14. So, beloved, since you are expecting these things, He's talking about the time when Jesus comes back and the heavens are parted. How many of you are expecting the second coming of Christ? Yes. How many of you think there is a possibility it could even be in your lifetime? Yes. Amen. And even if it's not, we want to live ready. Yes. Hallelujah. So, beloved, since you're expecting these things, be eager to be found by him at his coming without spot or blemish and at peace in serene confidence, free from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts. When Jesus comes back, how do you want him to find you? Anxious, worried, frustrated, upset, ready for a breakdown, running from everything in fear, timidity, no confidence, never having fulfilled your destiny. How does he want to find you? The Bible says he wants to find us living a holy life without spot or blemish. It says that he wants to find us in confidence because God has not given us a spirit of fear. He wants to find us free from fear and agitating passions. Now, I don't know how you feel, but I came to the point a long time ago in my life, I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to be a Christian, then I'm going to be a full-on hardcore Christian. I'm not going to just have one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world and just be lukewarm and just hope I can squeak in the back door of heaven. So every time I read in here that God wants me to do something, I get about trying to be what he wants me to be. When we read in here what God wants us to do, then we need to set about praying about it, getting in agreement with God, and we need to work with the Holy Spirit to move in the direction of the will of God. So when I read in here, God when he comes back, he wants to find me confident, then that makes me want to get rid of all lack of confidence. When I read and hear that he, when he comes back, he wants to find me at peace. Wow. Took me so many years just to get peaceful. And now I believe that he could come back and find me at peace. He wants to find us free from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts. When he comes back, I want him to find me in the right condition. The Bible tells us that in the last days, people's hearts are going to fail them for fear. Let me tell you something. If you look around at everything that's going on in the world today and you read the paper too much and listen to the news too much, you're going to be a mess. You need to read the good news, not the bad news. 
We need to pay more attention to God and what He says than what the world says. I'm telling you, I know conditions are bad in the world, but I also know that God has His eye on us. And I know that He has promised, if we will keep our eyes on Him, that He will always take care of us. And so don't get all caught up in the negativity of this is going to happen, and oh, that's going to happen, and this is going to happen. Have you heard about this? Have you heard about that? Just keep your eyes on God and do what you're supposed to do and trust God to take care of you. In Luke 18, the Bible says, who will he find in faith when he comes back? Verse 1 says, we ought always to pray and never turn coward and faint and give up. We should always keep pressing in with God. Tells a story about a woman who went to an unjust judge to be vindicated from something. And the judge didn't want to mess with her. But she kept pestering him. Kept pestering him. And finally he gave in just to get her to be quiet. And then it says, if an unjust judge will finally do that, what will our just God do for those who refuse to quit and give up? And let me tell you something. It does not take any special talent to give up. I mean, I used to threaten that give up thing three, four times a week, and I'm sure God was not the least bit impressed. And I get kind of weary of Christians who give up. It doesn't take any special talent to give up. You don't even have to be saved to give up. You don't have to do nothing to give up. Anybody can give up. But it takes courage to press forward and keep believing what the Word of God says during those seasons in your life where it looks to you in your circumstances like none of it is true. The Bible says that we sometimes look like sheep led to the slaughter. You ever feel like that? But right in the midst of all of these things, we are more than conquerors. You know what it means to be more than a conqueror? This is my own definition. This comes from the Joyce Dictionary. I believe what it means to be more than a conqueror is you know before you ever get the problem that you already have the victory. You know before the battle ever starts that you've already won the battle. You know why? Because you've already read the end of the book. You know who the winner is. I mean, honestly and truly, if we base our life on this, we cannot fail. <laughs> it is not even an option. We cannot fail. You may go through some things. It may take longer than you thought it would and be harder than you thought it would. But in the end, the meek shall inherit the promises of God. Amen. And it ain't over till it's over and it ain't over yet. I'm tired of people disrespecting Christians and disrespecting God. And one of the reasons why they disrespect God is because of the way Christians act a lot of times. And I think we either need to get in, get out, or get run over, but God's on the move. <laughs> and if we're going to call ourselves Christians, which means Christians, then we need to start acting like it. Can anybody say amen? amen? Fear is a dead end, but faith always has a future. Fear opens the door for Satan to work in our life. Faith opens the door for God to work in our life. Let me say it again. Fear is a dead end. Faith, however, always has a future. There's a scripture that I absolutely love in John chapter 11. It's the account of where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We're not going to go over that whole story, but in John chapter 11, verse 40, he said, Did I not tell you if you would only believe you would see the glory of God if you would only believe you know in many circumstances and situations you don't have a clue what to do but one thing you can do is believe you can keep believing matter of fact I know how easy it is to get into doubt and unbelief 
I know how easy it is to become afraid, and so I keep this sign sitting in my office right across from the chair that I sit in, and every time I glance up from my reading and my time in the morning where I spend time with God, I see that belief because I want to be reminded that there's only really one thing that God is asking me to do, and that's believe what He said. And if I'll do that, God will show me when I need to do something else, and when He does, He'll give me the grace to do whatever it is He asks me to do. Believing causes you to enter the rest of God, and there's no place better to be than in the rest of God. Oh, my gosh. When you're in the rest of God, it's like you know God's going to do something. You don't know what. You don't care what. You don't care when. It just really doesn't make you any difference because you have the confidence that God is faithful, and when the time is right, not your time, His time, when the time is right, then God's going to come through. I think some of you would do you well if you had one of these signs also. There's a lot of little places where you can buy things like this, or I don't care, cut one out of cardboard and paint it and put it on your wall. It doesn't matter, but get something in front of your face to remind you to not be afraid, to not get into doubt and unbelief, to not run away from things, but to start believing God. Only believe. And you will see the glory of God. I can't promise you when, can't promise you how. But I do know not only by the Word of God, but now thankfully I've had enough experience with God that I also know by experience that God is faithful. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to talk to you about some specific fears that we encounter in our life, some common fears. I won't cover all the list of fears, but just to kind of throw some out that I think a lot of people deal with, and I think this will be interesting for us. First of all, one of the things that I think that many people are afraid of is that we're afraid we're not going to get what we want. Think about that. Oh my gosh, I, I'm single and I want to be married. And what if I, what if I stay single my whole life? See, we get like that, don't we? It's like, oh. We have these things that we want God to do for us. And the very thought of not getting what we want just makes us almost frantic. Now, I'm going to use an example from my ministry, although this might not relate to your specific case, but you'll still get the point. When God called me to do what I'm doing, He put such a desire in me to do it that for a while it almost drove me crazy. Because when you want something so bad, you can't hardly stand it, and yet nothing's happening. <laughs> How many of you know where I'm at right now? It's like <laughs> frustrating to the point where you feel like you could just split wide open. And it was very difficult during those years because God had such a hold on me that I couldn't give up. And yet for reasons that I didn't understand then, but I do now, character flaws in me that he was dealing with, he wouldn't let me go on. So I couldn't give up and I couldn't go on. I couldn't have a failure and he wasn't letting me have a success. And somewhere in the midst of all that, I was getting squashed. And one day I was reading in John chapter 21, where Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Third time he asked him, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then I went on to read the rest of it. I'm going to make sure I have the right verse before I tell him to, to put it up. I think it's verse 18, John 21, 18.
Peter, do you love me? Yes, you know. Do you love me? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes, you know I love you. 15, 16, 17. So God asked him this three times because he's getting ready to drop a bomb on him. Verse 18, well, I assure you, Peter, and most solemnly I tell you, when you were young, let's just say when you were a baby Christian, you girded yourself, you put on your own belt or girdle, and you walked about wherever you pleased to go. Baby Christians just get to do whatever they want to. You just cute little sweet little thing, you. And you can just pray for just about anything, and God will just pinch your little cheeks and give it to you. You can get by with some of the dumbest stuff. You can need a word from God and just do one of these. You can have your little box of promise cards all over the house, and you can go and just get a word from God. But now you trust me, the day is going to come when you're going to have to grow up. And a lot of that stuff is not going to work anymore because God wants us eventually to be led by His Spirit, not by all kinds of outward signs and feelings and confirmations and angel appearances and prophecies and all that stuff. A real Christian sometimes has to go through years of what you might call a dry time. However, you can get to the point where you know God so well that dry doesn't even feel dry to you. Well, Joyce, what's God saying to you? Oh, get up, go to work, be a blessing, love me. Sometimes I'll go for a long time and God won't say anything specific to me. Well, what do you do? I just keep doing the last thing he said. Hello. You know, I read all these books about dry times and dry seasons and dark nights of the soul. And I know about all that, but I'll be honest and tell you, I don't have that mess anymore. You know why? Because I know that 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 I know. And when you know that you know that you know, I don't have to feel God to know that he's here. I just know. And the only way you get that is by experience. And whether you like it or not, God's giving you some divine experience. The only way you get that is by going through stuff, not by being delivered from everything that's uncomfortable. When you were young, Peter, you girded yourself and you did what you wanted to. But when you grow old, another will gird you and lead you where you do not wish to go. Does anybody understand this? What if God doesn't give you what you want? Thank you for your great response. Man, death just fell in the whole place. It's like, Well, well, he will, won't he? <laughs> Not necessarily. Because <laughs> maybe what you want, maybe what you think you want could be the worst thing in the world for you and you just don't even know that yet. The prodigal son thought he knew what he wanted too. I want my part of the inheritance. I want to go out and do my own thing and live my own life. And his father gave it to him. It always amazes me that he just gave it to him. No argument. He gave it to him. He knew he was going to go out and waste it and make a mess out of his life, but he gave it to him anyway. Because sometimes the only way that we can learn what we don't want is by having it. Some of you single people so antsy to get married, you're liable to marry the wrong person. Honey, you have never had misery. You think being single is bad? Oh, that is not bad. What's bad is being married to the wrong person. That's what's bad. We get afraid of so many things. I'm afraid of, well, 
I was sitting in my chair. It wasn't a chair this tall. It was a big cushy chair that I prayed in. This, is, this happened maybe 20 years ago. <sighs> Joyce, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Joyce, are you sure that you love me? Amen, Lord. I surrender all. Third time, Joyce, do you love me? Well, Lord, yes. Okay, well, Joyce, up until now, you've kind of done your own thing, and I've been blessing it. But now we're about to have a transition here. And here's the thing that came to my heart. Because I spent a lot of time praying for my ministry to grow. God said, what if I would ask you to forget all that and just go down by the riverfront and minister to 50 people the rest of your life? Would you do it? See, it's real easy to do big things. <laughs> it's, easy to, it's easy to have a goal to get that big promotion at work. But what if God asked you to pleasantly clean the toilets the rest of your life? Uh-oh, you ain't all clapping. I mean, well, what if God just said, you know, I need you here? I mean, Christians pray for a ministry and then God puts them in a company where they're the only Christian. And then they're coming to me for prayer to get out of that place because after all, I'm the only Christian there. And, so good. Yeah, 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 yeah. and then you'll leave for your own comfort and leave everybody else there to just go to hell. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you're really going to be committed to God, you may have to be a few places that aren't that comfortable for you. Well, I'm going to go find me somebody that wants to grow up and preach this to them. And when God said that to me, what if, what if this has all just kind of been in your head and I haven't really called you to a worldwide ministry and what if I would just ask you to forget all that right now and go down to the riverfront in St. Louis and minister to 50 people the rest of your life, would you do it? Now, let me tell you, right there, I had a moment with God. <laughs> and I'm going to be honest and tell you that fear gripped my heart. And I thought, <gasps> in a moment, all my plans and dreams were dashed. And I had to make a decision. And I literally remember falling out of the chair on the carpet. And I said, okay, God. If that's what you want, I'll do whatever you want me to do. So I'm just asking you today, whatever it is you think you want, what if you never got it? <laughs> Would you love God just as much anyway? See, I think something that we don't really fully understand is how much we seek God for what He can do for us when we really should be seeking God for who He is. Well, there are many different kinds of fear that can keep people from accomplishing all that God intends for their lives, but it doesn't have to be that way. If we learn to keep our eyes on God instead of our fears, we'll be able to do all that God has called us to do. He loves us, and His love guarantees us that we can be confident to press forward, to take action, and not to have to draw back in fear. Today, I'm really excited about my offer. We always like to offer you the Word of God because it's the greatest blessing in our lives. The Word of God has changed me, and it will change you, and it should be part of your everyday life as often as possible throughout the day. So we love devotionals. We do one at least every year. And our one right now, the new one that's being offered is called Love Out Loud. The subject of love is very important in the Bible. 
It actually seems to be the most important thing to Christ. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. And I think that we concentrate on a lot of things that are less important than our love walk, which we should be concentrating on. So this new devotional called Love Out Loud is about loving God, loving yourself, and loving other people. And we're offering this for your gift to the ministry of any amount. Now that's 365 devotionals that are gonna help you stay in love and to do it loud and aggressive. We offer it for any amount because we want everybody to be able to have it and we trust you to do your very best. Those who can give more can do so for those who can't give as much. Thank you, God bless you, and have a wonderful day. Does it seem like the answers to life's pain and problems have gotten a little complex? Perhaps the answer is more simple than you realize. In Joyce Meyer's newest devotional, Love Out Loud, you'll learn that the key to successful living is as basic as loving God, loving ourselves in a balanced way, and in turn sharing that love with others. For a limited time, we're offering Love Out Loud devotional for a donation of any amount. Contact us right now, 1-800-727-9673, or visit us online at JoyceMeyer.org. This 30th anniversary celebration is your moment to shine like never before. Giggle with delight. Throw caution to the wind. Radiate God's love. Celebrate with women from all over the world at the 30th Anniversary 